Italian and Northern Renaissance Art Audio Lecture. Renaissance Art. Patronage. In addition to religious art, artists emphasized individuals and everyday life, subjects that were now deemed appropriate by the elites who were commissioning the works of art. Florence was the leader in the 1400s, which is also known as the Quattrocento. Massive patronage for the arts came from wealthy merchant families, such as the Medici family that we've talked about, who commissioned countless works from great artists. As a matter of fact, if it were not for families like the Medici, we would not even know about many of the most famous artists in the world from this time period. Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Raphael, etc. In essence, the wealth of Florence was mirrored by the superb artistic output of the Renaissance that came primarily from that city-state. A good example is Donatello's David, which stood in the Medici courtyard during the wedding of Lorenzo de' Medici. We will see examples of this later on in this lecture. In Milan, the Sforzads commissioned such works as Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper, to be seen in a bit. Patronage also came from local churches, who increasingly saw Renaissance art as a means of glorifying God. Some notable examples include Brunelleschi's Il Duomo, which is the dome on the Florentine Cathedral. It was built for the Santa Maria del Fiore Cathedral. If you look at the top left corner of this slide, you will see Il Duomo. Ghiberti's two sets of doors were opposite of Il Duomo. They were created for the baptistry, which sat directly across the street from Il Duomo. We will see examples of this later as well. Michelangelo's David was another one. It was originally commissioned for the cathedral, for it to be raised up closer to the roof, but it was too heavy and thus it was placed elsewhere. A century later, the center of the artistic universe shifted from Florence to Rome. Rome became the artistic center in the Cinquecento, the 1500s. The decline of Florence in the late 1400s resulted in this shift to Rome. Pope Alexander VI, who reigned as Pope from 1492 to 1503, spent huge sums of money on patronage of the arts. Notable works commissioned by the church in this period include the following. Michelangelo's dome atop St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, his paintings on the Sistine Chapel ceiling in Rome, and his Pieta. We will see examples of all of these later on in this lecture. Raphael's School of Athens is also one from this time period in Rome. Bramante's Tempietto and his floor plan for a newly rebuilt St. Peter's Cathedral are also examples. Again, you will see all of these in later slides of this lecture. New artistic techniques that came out of the Renaissance. First of all, for painting. The Renaissance saw the invention of geometric perspective, where three-dimensional effects are shown on a two-dimensional surface. Medieval works, in contrast, looked flat and two-dimensional. You see here an example. This is a 12th century illuminated manuscript that illustrates the flat perspective of medieval painting. In contrast, this Renaissance work, early, although it be, uh, by Masaccio, the Trinity from 1425, demonstrates an emphasis on perspective. You see depth in this painting, the attempt to show three dimensions on a two-dimensional plane. Another development was chiaroscuro. 
the use of dark and light colors to create the illusion of depth. Giotto, in his The Morning of Christ, Giotto is considered to be the first painter of the Renaissance, one of the first to use perspective and chiaroscuro. Notice his use of chiaroscuro to make the robes worn by the figures look realistic. His use of perspective among the various persons in the painting is more convincing than typical medieval works. Faces of subjects expressed unique individual characteristics, embodying the Renaissance ideal of individualism. Renaissance subjects typically showed more emotion than medieval subjects. Medieval paintings were more stylized, i.e. generic, in their portrayal of human faces. The woman portrayed on the right is one of several figures in Sandro Botticelli's Primavera. Notice his use of chiaroscuro around the jawline to provide depth and his attention to detail regarding the figure's facial figure features. Sumato is another development in the Renaissance. It was developed by Leonardo da Vinci. Sfumato is seen as a, quote, smoky effect technique of blurring or softening sharp lines. One of the most famous paintings in all of the world, in all of world history, is da Vinci's Mona Lisa. It was painted between 1503 and 1506, and it demonstrates da Vinci's use of sfumato to create a smoky effect in the painting, as well as blurred lines on the subject's face. Sculpture. Let's talk about sculptural developments. Medieval sculpture from the period before the Renaissance often appeared on buildings and tombs and were highly detailed and did not glorify the human body so much. Here is an example from a 14th century Gothic tomb. They were mostly relief sculptures protruding from a surface. These four sculptures adorn the Chart Cathedral, Chart Cathedral in France. Their detail and high relief are indicative of the Gothic style. Chart Cathedral in France. Renaissance sculpture as off, was often freestanding and designed to be seen in the round, meaning walk all the way around the piece and see it from all sides. Renaissance sculptors were highly influenced by ancient Greek and Roman statuary, which were also often designed to be seen in the round. This is the Discobolus, a Roman copy from, 14, from um, 140 CE of an earlier Greek statue. Many sculptures glorified the human body like those ancient sculptures, and many portrayed nude figures like those works from ancient Greece and Rome. These had not really been seen since the ancient world, and were pretty shocking when artists started to portray um, figures in the nude once again. Like Renaissance painting, many Renaissance sculptures glorified the individual. Here is, are some examples of ancient sculpture that was copied by the Renaissance sculpture. This is the Venus de Milo on the right from the second century BCE. The Farnese uh, Hercules, a third century CE copy of an ancient Greek statue from the fourth century BCE. The Greeks, as you can see, glorified the human body, a style that influenced the Romans and then later the artists of the Renaissance. Compare it to Donatello's David that I mentioned before. This was completed in 1440, and this was the piece that was in the Medici. Um, gardens, if you will, for the wedding of Lorenzo de' Medici. Donatello's David became the first bronze statue created in Europe since antiquity. Notice the statue's contrapposto stance, meaning putting most of the weight on one leg, showing a curved um, angle to the body, a kind of relaxing pose, if you will. Michelangelo's David from fifth, between 1501 and 1504 bears many of the same qualities as ancient Greek statuary. The use of marble, 
the glorification of the human body, and the contrapposto stance. Architecture. The Gothic style of architecture during the Middle Ages or the medieval period was highly or ornamented with pointed arches, spires, flying buttresses, and a grand scale. The Gothic Cathedral in Cologne, Germany, you can see here, showing spires going up to the heavens to force your eye to look upward. Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, between the 12th to 14th centuries, it was added on. And you see, this is a prime example of Gothic architecture as well, including the flying buttresses. Renaissance architecture utilized ancient Greek and Roman forms, such as Greek temple architecture with the triangular pediments, columns, and Roman arches and domes, like on the Pantheon in Rome. The Renaissance emphasized simplicity, symmetry, and balance, and they used these ancient um, examples and um, use them as uh, inspiration for their new designs and their new buildings. Here's an example of the Pantheon from ancient Rome. You see the outer um, view, from aerial view from um, the top on the left and then interior view on the right. Pair this with St. Peter's Basilica with the redesigned 16th century um, idea, especially with the dome prom uh, by prominent Renaissance artists and architects. St. Peter's contains strong elements of Greek temple architecture and Roman arches, and its Roman-inspired dome is the largest in Europe. Thanks to Michelangelo for building it, or designing it anyways. Florentine Renaissance artists. This would be, again, from the Quattrocento, the 1400s primarily. Giotto was earlier, was one of the earliest of these Italian Renaissance artists. Remember, he's the one we mentioned that was the first to use perspective. He's considered the perhaps the first Renaissance artist with his use of chiaroscuro and perspective both. An example, Giotto's flight into Egypt. You see both chiaroscuro and perspective used. This is very early, 1305. Here is Giotto's Agnesanti Madonna from 1310. The use of chiaroscuro and perspective foreshadows the Renaissance, yet the stylized faces and somewhat flat appearance still illustrates the medieval style. That's why oftentimes Giotto is considered the transitional artist, transitioning from the medieval period and the medieval style to the Renaissance period and the Renaissance style. Filippo Brunelleschi from 1377 to 1446. He is the one responsible for Il Duomo, atop the Santa Maria del Fiore Cathedral in Florence. This is his masterpiece. It was the largest dome in Europe at the time of its construction. It will later be eclipsed by St. Peter's Basilica. Il Duomo was completed in 1434. He, however, Brunelleschi, is considered the, quote, father of linear perspective. He's one of the people that also figured out how to build a dome um, since this knowledge had been lost since the ancient world. No one had built a dome since the Roman era. It's as if during the Romanesque and the Gothic periods during um, the uh, Middle Ages, they forgot how to do a dome. He went and observed the Pantheon uh, very meticulously, and he eventually cracked the code, if you will, and was able to build the first dome since antiquity. Brunelleschi's son Miniato Almonte in Florence is another example showing you his use of old Greek and Roman styles with the triangular pediments the um, arches and the columns. 
Leon Batista Alberti from 1404 to 1472 is also an example of an architect that was influenced by ancient Greek and Roman architecture. He was an architect of several famous cathedrals using Greek and Roman force, forms. This is the Tempio Malatestatanio in Rimini. Sorry about the pronunciation. He wrote the first treatise on linear perspective, although Brunelleschi is credited with inventing it, showing depth. Lorenzo Ghiberti is another example of a Renaissance artist. He is a sculptor. He lived between 1378 and 1455. He's famous largely because he won a famous contest in 1403 against Brunelleschi, who, the one who built the dome, uh, that earned him the commission to sculpt the bronze doors for the Florentine baptistry, which was situated right across the street opposite of Il Duomo. His two sets of bronze doors, 1424 and 1452, they were built 30 years apart, are now considered a masterpiece of sculpture. Michelangelo called his second set of doors the Gates of Paradise. Both Ghiberti and Brunelleschi, as well as several others, were asked to try out for the commission of the doors. On one side of the baptistry, each artist had to submit a panel illustrating the sacrifice of Isaac to be judged to see who would get the commission. The winner you see is on the left. Isaac's body looked more humanistic, more realistic. Second place, close but no cigar, was Brunelleschi's. And you see, it looks a little more violent with Abraham almost stabbing his son but being stopped with the hand of God via the angel to stop him. These are the east door baptistries, east doors on the baptistry of Florence. This door is famous for its 28 panels, and this is the one that Michelangelo referred to as the Gates of Paradise, created by Ghiberti. Now Donatello, who we just mentioned before with the David, we're going to talk a little bit more about him here. Donatello lived from 1386 to 1466. His bronze statue of David, completed between 1408 and 09, was the first full-size bronze statue since antiquity. He was the first Renaissance artist to utilize a nude figure in sculpture as well. Once again, nude figures had not been used in sculpture since the ancient world just like the domes had not been used in, in architecture since the ancient world. So this is a perfect example of how the Renaissance looked back to the past to find ways to advance in the future. They copy the past, but they also move forward at the same time, pushing the envelope, creating new ways of looking at things, perspective, new innovations, etc. Masaccio is another Renaissance artist, Italian Renaissance artist, a painter. He lived between 1401 and 1428. He's perhaps the first Renaissance painter to portray real human figures in 3D in paint. This is one of his most famous, the expulsion of Adam and Eve that was finished in 1427. It's a fresco and shows tremendous emotion which was another hallmark of the Renaissance. Now, this also shows you fresco. A fresco painting is a, a Renaissance style of painting where they used wet plaster on a wall and they painted directly onto the wet plaster. This created a kind of permanence because the painting itself became part of the wall. Santa Botticelli is another very famous Italian painter. He was a painter of the birth of Venus from 1485 to 86. The painting is a good example of humanism as the subject is Venus, the Roman goddess of love. Venus stands in contrapposto with more weight on one leg than the other. 
This technique was used frequently in ancient Greek and Roman statuary, as we have already seen. We'll see an example of this painting in a moment, but just I wanted to show you this one little part. Botticelli even painted his own self-portrait into many of his paintings. This is an example here from his Adoration of the Magi, painting and painted in 1475, where he's looking directly out at the viewer. He's tooting his own horn, needless to say. He's a Renaissance man. He thinks he's awesome. This is the birth of Venus. Probably one of my favorite Renaissance paintings. Showing you the contrapposto pose of Venus. Of course, the fact that we have a rejuvenation of these old ancient themes in paintings, these old pagan ancient themes in paintings also, is another part, hallmark of the Renaissance, if you will. Here's another Botticelli piece, another very famous Botticelli piece, La Primavera from 1485. Again, Venus in the center. You see um, um, the uh, muses dancing. You also see other uh, Greek figures throughout um, with the birth of spring. The High Renaissance is centered in Rome in the 16th century, the 1500s, if you will, when the focus shifted from Florence to Rome as the center of the artistic universe for the Italian Renaissance. The worldly Renaissance popes like Alexander VI, Julius II, and Leo X all provided tremendous patronage to the arts. Characteristics were classical balance, harmony, and restraint. Bramante, 1444 to 1514, is an architect that was very famous during this time period. His Tempietto San Pietro in Montorio that we saw an example of before marked the beginning of the High Renaissance in Rome around 1502 when Alexander VI appointed him to build a statuary that allegedly marked the spot where Peter himself was crucified in the Nero persecutions in 64 AD. He was the principal architect of the rebuilt St. Peter's Cathedral, although some of his plans were altered after his death, mostly by Michelangelo, in particular, the dome on top of St. Peter's. Don, Donato Bramate's Tempietto that I've showed you before, here's another view of it. In the courtyard of San Pietro in Montorio, is considered one of the architectural masterpieces of the High Renaissance. It kind of looks like the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., doesn't it? You can see the neoclassical style that we adopted in the United States back in the 19th, 19th century was very much a, another rejuvenation of old classical themes. Here is St. Peter's Basilica, or the Vatican that was redesigned and rebuilt between 1546 and 1564. Leonardo da Vinci is another world famous artist from this time period. He is often seen as the quintessential Renaissance man. He's a painter, a sculptor, an architect, an engineer, a writer, a scientist. He was a jack of all trades and a master of all trades. His Mona Lisa, that was painted between 1503 and 1507, is considered one of the great masterpieces in all of art history with all of the developments, including sfumato that we mentioned before. Leonardo developed that technique of sfumato, a haze that softens the edges of objects in the painting. And we still use this today, not just in painting, but even in photography. Ever heard of the soft focus lens on a camera? Yeah, that's what that is. The Last Supper that he painted earlier in 1498 is a fresco in Milan, paint on wet plaster. Probably one of the most famous frescoes that's ever been painted. Here it is, 1498, tempera on plaster. It's painted on the wall of the convent of Santa, Santa Maria della Grazia the refectory in Milan. 
Here's Leonardo's study of man or study of proportions of man. He was also known for his detailed studies of human anatomy. Another famous artist from the Italian Renaissance is Raphael Santi. He was a painter. Now remember folks, all of these um, Renaissance artists are probably some of the most famous artists in the world still to this day. If you don't know any names of artists, you at least know the names of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You have Michelangelo, you have Donatello, you have Leonardo, all of which we've talked about already, and now Raphael. Raphael Santi. He created many numerous Madonna and Child paintings. This is his Sistine Madonna that was painted in 1512. The painting was commissioned by Pope Julius II as an altarpiece for the Church of San Sisto Piacenta. Cienza. Raphael, also Madonna of the Chair, this is perhaps his most widely copied painting in the world. And many times at Christmas time, if you go and purchase Christmas stamps, you will see this painting or copies of this painting on that stamp. The School of Athens, probably one of the most famous paintings that shows up on AP exams fairly often, very, fairly regularly, 1509 by Raphael. It is the quintessential example of humanism in painting. Greco-Roman architecture is prominent. Plato and Aristotle are in the center of the painting. Numerous thinkers and scientists and mathematicians from the ancient world up to the current day in the Renaissance are all included throughout the work. The sculptures featured in the painting are nude and in contrapposto stance as a nod to the ancient world. I'll show you an example of this. School of Athens, that is the entirety and it is on a wall inside the Vatican in Rome. Now some Here's detail one. This is Plato and Aristotle who are right in the center of the painting. So a nod to the ancient world. Here's detail number two, Heraclitus, which is also, he also utilized Michelangelo's features on Heraclitus. That's Michelangelo's face. Detail three, Euclid in the center, Ptolemy, the back facing the viewer, and Zoroaster wearing the white robe. All famous um, mathematicians and um, thinkers, philosophers from the ancient world. Detail four, Pythagoras, that you probably learned about last year with ancient Greece, with his book. Averroes, the white, with the white headgear on, and Parmendes, the orange robe. Again, all ancient world thinkers from different parts of the ancient world, from the Near East, from Greece, from Rome, you name it. Detail five, Zoroaster, the founder of Zoroastrianism, Ptolemy, Raphael himself, and Sodoma. Raphael himself is looking out at us. I'm the figure of the second from the right. Okay, Michelangelo is probably the most famous of all Renaissance artists. He lived between 1475 and 1564. He's probably most famous for his painting of the Sistine Chapel ceiling, 1508 to 1512. What's kind of ironic about this is Michelangelo saw himself primarily as a sculptor. When he was commissioned to do this painting, he fought the Pope who had commissioned him to do it. He did not want to paint this ceiling. But alas, if the Pope requires you to paint in Italy, in the Renaissance period, you can't really back out of it. So he eventually did paint the ceiling. It's commissioned by Pope Julius II. The Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. The ceiling here is seen in relation to the other frescoes on the wall. The entire room is covered in Michelangelo paintings. 
This is probably the most famous part of it. It's right in the center of the room and right in the center of the ceiling, I should say. The creation of Adam. Sculpturally, however, like I said, Michelangelo considered himself a sculptor first. His most famous sculpture is the David, 1501 to 1504. His David is different than Donatello's David. It is done in marble rather than in bronze. But like Donatello's, it is shown in contrapposto style as well as in, in the nude, as well as to be seen in the round. It's marble humanistic sculpture that glorifies the human body in the contrapposto stance, while facial features are still very individualistic. It was commissioned by the Cathedral Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence, the Duomo. His Pieta, 1499, is, is where he shows Mary holding the limp body of Christ after he was taken off of the cross. The dead Christ, you can see his limp body. You can almost see the humanism, the anguish that had been on his face. And you see the bowed head of Mary in her grief showing humanism in these religious figures, showing their humanity, and ultimately drawing us closer to them. We feel closer to them if we see them as feeling the same kind of pains that we feel. The Pieta was commissioned for a French cardinal's funeral monument. The cardinal was a representative in Rome at the time. Architecturally, Michelangelo was also very busy. He designed the enormous dome atop St. Peter's Basilica. The Venetian School. By the end of the 1400s and into the 1500s, we see the development of a new kind of painting in the Italian Renaissance known as the Venetian School. And the most famous practitioner from the Venetian School is Titian. 1485-1576. He's perhaps the greatest painter of the Venetian school. The Venetian school is known for its use of very vivid colors and movement being shown in, in um, the, the paintings, in contrast to more subtle colors and more static figures of the Florentine style that preceded. Here is Titian's The Passaro Madonna. You see the bright reds. When you see Titian pieces, he was very fond of using reds. Titian's Tarquin and Lucretia. You see lots of action in this. Um, yes, it's, it's not moving, but you can almost see the figures moving. The use of dramatic action and color um, effects points towards the Baroque style, which will follow the Renaissance. The Baroque is known to be more violent, more emotional, um, more uh, out of the box, if you will. And so Titian is sometimes seen as that transitional figure between the high Renaissance and the Baroque style. Andrea Palladino, sorry, Palladio is another um, famous artist. He is one of the most influential architects in modern European history. Here's his La Rotonda. Again, you can see the Greek influences, the Greek and Roman influences, the triangular pediments, the columns, and then of course the dome, as you can see, poking up from the back there. His works are heavily influenced by Greek architecture. Now, Mannerism is a period of late Renaissance art, actually after you move out of the high Renaissance and again, as you are moving towards the Baroque style. We'll talk more about mannerism later, but the characteristics are, it's a reaction against the Renaissance ideals of balance, symmetry, simplicity, and the realistic use of color. The high Renaissance had taken art to perfection. There was little that could be done to improve it. Thus, the mannerist painters rebelled against that perfection. And instead, their works often used unnatural colors while shapes were elongated or otherwise exaggerated. Some of the most famous were Tintoretto. He lived from 1518 to 1594. He was of the Venetian school. He was later than Titian. Uh, he used elongated figure proportions, 
twisted poses, and compression of space. But probably the most famous of the Mannerist painters is El Greco from 1541 to 1614. He was a Greek artist, that's why he was referred to as El Greco, which means the Greek, but he did most of his painting in Spain. He had moved to Spain. Perhaps he's the greatest of the Mannerists with his use of elongated figures and unnatural pigments. The burial of Count Orgaz, 1586 to 88, down below on the left, and his Toledo, painted in 1597, are two important examples of his work. Elongated figures, dramatic use of unnatural colors, um, and almost pushing towards the macabre or even the weird, some would argue. Thank you. Audio lecture on Northern Renaissance art for the guided notes in section Roman numeral six of the Northern Renaissance lecture, which is lecture 02RB on Canvas. We will move on to Roman numeral seven in class. Northern Renaissance art. First of all, we need to talk a little bit about the differences between the Italian Renaissance style and the Northern Renaissance style. It really all began in the Northern Renaissance with the Flemish style the, in the Low Countries. The Low Countries were the area just to the north of France that were mostly low-lying countries, places like Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, uh, and they produced especially important artists. The characteristics of the Flemish style were as such. They were heavily influenced by the Italian Renaissance, but they had more minute detail throughout the paintings, especially in the background, than the Italian Renaissance artists. They also differed in the use of oil paints, in contrast to the Italian Renaissance that used tempera on plaster to create those frescoes we discussed. It was also much more emotional than the Italian style. Now, many Art historians have argued that the Flemish style of Renaissance painting was a transition between the Italian High Renaissance style and what will come along later called Mannerism, and that will also give way eventually to the Baroque style of art. The works often were preoccupied with death and dark scenes. Jan van Eyck is probably one of the most famous of the Northern Renaissance artists. He lived between 1395 and 1441. He's the most famous and innovative Flemish painter of the 15th century. He's the one responsible for perfecting oil painting. He also used uh, wood panels to paint upon. Naturalistic wood panel paintings were used much um, in his religious symbolism that he usually incorporated into his works. He employed incredible detail in his works. If you look at this self-portrait of his that was painted in 1433, you will see what I mean by incredible detail. Even the little folds of the turban that he has on his head, lines around the eyes and the mouth, the nose and the shading of the nose, etc. His masterpiece is the Ghent altarpiece done in 1432 that you see below on the left. And then also his Arnolfini and his wife, or the wedding of Arnolfini as it's sometimes referred to from 1434, which is on the bottom right. This is probably his most famous work uh, individually. If you look, you can see the detail in the background. He even has a mirror on the wall that if looked at closely, you can see what would be showing in that mirror in the natural world. You would see the backs of the couple that are there, and you also can see the painter himself painting on an easel, painting this very painting. Another famous Northern Renaissance artist is Peter Bruegel, the Elder, 1520 to 1569. He focused on lives of ordinary people. This is another thing that differentiated the Northern Renaissance from the Italian Renaissance. The Italian Renaissance focusing more on 
um, religious figures, showing them in humanistic ways, but religious figures, as well as uh, classical figures from the ancient Greek and Roman times, Greek gods and goddesses. But also, if they did show portraits of regular normal people, it was normally the wealthy, the nobility. Peter Bruegel focused on the lives of ordinary people. He was not influenced much by the Italian Renaissance at all, except for maybe in perspective. But focusing on peasantry, focusing on, quote, the dirty people, as some would often say. Here are two of his most famous works, The Peasant Dance on the left and The Battle Between Carnival and Lent. Both of them produced around 1560. Now in Germany, we have Albrecht Dürer, 1471 to 1528. He is the foremost Northern Renaissance artist. He was the master of the woodcut and the first Northern artist to master Italian Renaissance techniques of proportion, perspective, and modeling. His notable works include Adam and Eve, Night, Death, and the Devil, and the Four Apostles, all of which you'll see here in a moment. He painted numerous self-portraits as well. Here is Adam and Eve, the upper right-hand side, the night, death, and the devil on the left in the middle, and the portrait of the Moorish woman, Katharina, on the bottom right. Here are some Durer self-portraits. He painted himself a lot oftentimes presenting himself, as you see on the left, as Jesus Christ. And then, of course, another one on the right. He was very proud of his curly hair, you can see. Okay, our next Northern Renaissance artist is Hans Holbein the Younger, another German painter, 1497 to 1543. By the way, I do want to mention, I will use the word German um, early in the year, but we're mostly referring to it as an ethnic group or a regional group. Um, there is no unified German nation at this point. Mostly these are Germanic territories, um, principalities, independent principalities, kind of like we saw in Italy with the city-states in Italy. We will not have a unified Germany until 1871, which we will get to later on in the year. <clears throat> Anyways, Hans Holbein the Younger, 1497 to 1543. He was known as the premier portrait painter of his era. He painted all of the most famous um, Renaissance uh, folks in Northern Europe. He painted Erasmus. He painted Sir Thomas More several paintings of King Henry VIII and Henry's family members as well. The Ambassadors is one of his most famous works that's not just a portrait um, of one individual, it's uh, numerous individuals, painted in 1553. It encompasses several of the major themes of the Northern Renaissance era. It covers exploration, religious discord as we start seeing the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation. It shows a preoccupation with death as well as the rising tide of international relations in an age of expansion. We'll see the um, painting that I was just referring to <clears throat> on um, the bottom here, the bottom right, the French ambassadors 1553. You see exploration with the globe in the background um, and all of those other um, items that I mentioned before. Uh, up at the top, the top left, you see Holbein's portrait, probably his most famous portrait of King Henry VIII, painted in 1540. Henry VIII and all his glory. We'll talk more about Henry VIII uh, in Unit 2. Now, we mentioned when we talked about the Italian Renaissance, uh, and the art of the Italian Renaissance. We mentioned the importance of patronage. Uh, and I mentioned how the Medici family, especially under Lorenzo the Magnificent, became a major patron of the arts. In Northern Europe, I guess you would say the equivalent to the Medici in importance for art patronage would be the Fugger family in Germany, especially 
Jakob Fugger, or Jacob as we call him, Fugger. Uh, he lived from 1459 to 1525, and he's probably the most significant of all of the patrons of the arts of the Northern Renaissance. Here is an Albrecht Durer portrait of Jacob Fugger from 1518 down on the bottom. The Fugger family's fortune was the result of international banking, just like the Medici in Florence. In fact, they were in major competition with the Medici for international banking. 